And you were only 21. I think you are the youngest ever uh, to this day to win Best Actress. Still the youngest Best, best Actress winner. It's funny, <laughs> every year I kind of play a game. When I watch to see who's nominated, the first thing I want to know is, how old are they? <laughs> Welcome to the actor's side today. I have an Academy Award winner, four-time Emmy nominee, Golden Globe winner, so many different awards. She also holds many different records, which I want to talk to her about, and you all know her, Marley Matlin. Hi. <laughs> hi, 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 hi. So good to see you, as always. Yeah, you too, you too. I feel like I was there sort of at the beginning of your career. I was talking to Jack, your interpreter here, who's been with you now like 36 years or something. I, I was working at Entertainment Tonight uh, during Children of a Lesser God and, uh, and following all that, and it just seems like it's flowing by. I mean, but here you are. Uh, I'm only 28. How is yeah. it possible? <laughs> How is I that mean, possible? when you look back, what an amazing career, uh, you know, to look back on at, at this point. And, uh, and then have Coda right now, this extraordinary movie that ever since it swept Sundance, I don't think any other movie's done what that did at Sundance in terms of awards. To have that now too must feel just great. It's, it feels just it's very, very good. I'm very much appreciating the acknowledgement uh, where, I mean, being in this business, as you said, 36 years, I've never seen so much, uh, so much of a phenomenon surrounding a film and to, that includes deaf actors, that has, let alone a movie which has 40% uh, American Sign Language in it. Uh, since Children of a Lesser God, I would think, where at that time people, of course, were surprised to see, they ne had never seen a deaf character in film played by a deaf person before, to see a story, a love story between two people, one hearing and one deaf. To this point, now we have three actors who are deaf, mm -hmm. authentically deaf, carrying the film and this story is just a feel-good universal story everyone really needs it these days i think i think the timing is perfect for coda you know it's it's it is exactly that it's a feel-good story but it's funny as hell too <laughs> it is it is it is it's not sappy in any way i don't think it's yeah. uh it's it's a combination of humor uh, drama uh, it's a, the family dynamics, people can so identify with the family dynamics that seeing all the perspectives that the film provides or even learn about with deaf people in it. I think it's just a simple, simple package and tells a great story. Now, this is based on a French film and they, they had two hearing actors playing deaf roles. When you became attached, you actually said you were not going to do this unless it was deaf actors and kudos to you on doing that too but it wasn't an easy road and it hasn't been an easy road i don't think it, in all honesty and to tell you the truth i was well it, it was strange it sounds strange because knowing how sometimes 
you try to keep your mouth shut, <laughs> you know, uh, because it, it, it's just, you don't want it to bite you back. Yet, uh, yet I thought to myself, well, what am I waiting for? It's been 36 years for me and watching everything unfold, having to do in good ways and sometimes in bad ways where they didn't cast authentically or there were so many actors out there who were deaf who passed or looked over uh, who hadn't had the opportunity to work. So, I mean, when they said we're thinking about the possibility of Frank, the father, being played by a hearing actor, I said, well, wait a minute, not on my watch. That's mm -hmm. not going to happen. It's just time. So I said something and I said, I'm out of here if we cast it the way it was originally intended. And I stuck to my guns and it worked because it made sense. People realized that, yes, absolutely, we need to, to cast authentically. It's about time. Have you felt since you won that Oscar that there's almost a responsibility on you are to date, to now, the only person, not just actor, in any category to have won an Academy Award who's deaf? And that is a, a significant achievement, but one that needs to be expanded. I think in this business, and have you felt like you you have a responsibility here to carry on this and, and make sure it happens because of your notoriety? Believe me, believe me, Pete. It's uh, I I'm talking about from day one, <laughs> from day one that we need more work for deaf actors. I can't be the only one out there. Uh, yes, it does help that I have an Oscar. Yes, it does help that I have a Golden Globe. Yes, it does help that I have four nominations for an Emmy. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that they can't be included. I mean, I keep saying it over and over again. It takes one, just one person, to understand what we can do as actors who are deaf or as writers or as directors. And it's, it's, I think now, though, with generations that are changing, but it's still the same thing. New people come to power, new people leave. Everyone, I have to tell over and over again, this is what we have to do. We have to collaborate. We have to work together. We have to teach each other. And you'd be surprised. This is exactly what happened with CODA. It made history. Mm -hmm. It definitely has made history, and it's so beautifully made, too, because it's not afraid. I was talking to your director about this. It's not afraid to have silences uh, on screen there and let this play out as in real life, not add the music and all of these other things. And I think that was very unique when I saw this movie, too, and I go, wow. You, it's unique for you, but yeah. it's not unique for us. Exactly. <laughs> so what you got the opportunity to do is to see through the eyes of a deaf person. Yeah. Which is, which is wonderful. And Jackie is such a great character, too. First of all, she is such a sexual person. I love that aspect of her and, and that relationship between Jackie and, and her husband here, too. It's a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun as a couple together. We, I mean, we, we protected each other. Um, we, we knew what we wanted for each other and for our kids. Uh, both Jackie and I are very much alike that way. It's just that, uh, I mean, it's all about watching out for your family. Um, Troy and I really had a pleasure to jump into these characters, to play these two, this married couple. And Troy is just one genius of an actor. He's the master of improvisation. And it's just, he knows how to work with other actors. And we, we bonded immediately. It was so seamless. And... Yes, at the same time, to include humor, to include uh, pathos, to include everything that we felt was right for our characters and in the film or even in the scene. It was just perfect. I can't even imagine any other actors working together playing these roles that we did, especially with Frank. Certainly after you see it, they're wonderful, you know, and they've done local theater, they've done uh, regional theater and all things. They've been acting uh, and had wonderful careers, but now you brought them to another level of recognition. Absolutely, absolutely. Troy Kotzer has been around a long time, much longer than people realize, but his face and his name has been out and center for Hollywood to see for a long time. And now we have a chance to see him up close in person. I'm so excited for this journey that he's on, and I'm happy to be there with him. Yeah, uh, totally. You know, uh, you started at a very young age, beyond 35 years. You actually, I guess you were in The Wizard of Oz. Was that your first thing? It was, it was. <laughs> I did The Wizard of Oz in Chicago, and I got the acting bug immediately. My parents saw that, and I was really fortunate that we had what was called the Center on Deafness near our home. It was just... Uh, an art center for hearing and deaf kids to perform together and 
signed together and that's where I met Henry Winkler and he became my mentor at 12 years old and he's still my mentor today and I really was very fortunate that I had him to guide me through everything and through life and through work. Wow, how did you meet, did he come see a show you were in or how did that relationship start? He was, well, we found out that he was making an appearance, him and his wife in Chicago for a, a charity or a documentary and we invited him our, for a fundraiser, for an event. And we found out that he was going to be there. He was a Fonz was coming. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. I wasn't going to take no for an answer in terms of meeting him. I went right up to him. Right after, the, well, actually, I signed my heart out right in front. He was there in the front row. And I just signed a song to him. And I still remember it to this day very vividly. And he just looked at me like this. And then when we were done, I went up to him and said, hi, I'm Marley. And I, will be, I want to be an actor in Hollywood just like you. And I'm not talking about small little local theaters. I'm not talking about community theater. I dreamt big. And he said, sure, why not? Just follow your heart and your dreams will come true. That kind of you know, pep talk. But I took it very seriously because eight and a half years later, I had an Oscar in my hand. That is... <laughs> it wasn't easy, but, and I worked for it, but I was very fortunate that I got to meet him and Whoopi Goldberg did the same thing to me. She always had give, gave me advice when I came to Hollywood, uh, when I had questions. And so I was very lucky in that arena. TV-wise, I was looking at your television credits. These are my favorite shows that you've done. Incredible. Seinfeld, Larry Sanders, Law and Order. The West SV. Wing. I, uh, Picket Fences. Picket Fences. I mean, the, the practice. You name it. The L Word. <laughs> Quantico, yeah. What, what, what are all those experiences like being a part of these legendary shows? So fun because each one of those people who actually worked on those shows, people like Aaron Sorkin, Eileen Chaikin, David Kelly, uh, Michael Seitzman, um, all of them were people who believed in me. Simple as that. And they didn't write my characters as, you know, a person who is deaf, who is struggling with being deaf and dwelling on being deaf. They just happened to be deaf and they were very creative and they weren't afraid to write me into a show as a character and I'm extremely grateful and I think we need more people like that. And are you, you, are you paving the path still for yourself here, developing your own projects and things uh, now too? I understand there's one with a royal uh, tinge to it that you're uh, the princess, uh, uh, I forget the name of the princess, Princess Alice. So Princess Alice, um, that one right now, we're, we're working out the story elements. I, I, you know, I'm trying to find stories that go beyond what we typically think a deaf person can do. I, right. I tr I'm every day thinking of something. I'll call up Jack and I'll say, what do we have? What can we find in the news? What can we see that's, that's current and topical? And, and because I, I'm always on the run, and I, it's just what I love to do. I can't imagine sitting still. I can't imagine doing anything else. Yeah, and so, but you do. Like everybody, like so many um, top actors in the business form their own production companies and develop this material for things they want to play because, quite frankly, the industry is full of I mean, just... I, mean, I, I Listen, it's, I still struggle, I have to admit. I still have to have... I mean, I still find um, things that we need to... Uh, show, prove that this is something I can do. Uh, it's, there's still a bit of a, I had the process of trying to convince people to make things happen. I'm still doing that. I'm still trying to chase that every elusive green light. I, I sometimes think I'm the only person going through this, but I, I found out that I'm not. And you were so great. I've seen you in, uh, talking about television shows, Dancing with the Stars, that was, an, and, I, and I thought of music, and you are very attuned to music in your way, right? And, and, and I've, always, I've always been, because I have two older brothers who introduced me to Billy Joel when I was a young girl, and to James Taylor, and I learned to hear the lyrics through my hearing aids, and Billy Joel now knows me. He knows that I'm a huge fan of his, and <laughs> he's always been so kind, and we've worked together. And um, I think music is, is a beautiful thing, regardless of whether, I, I mean, I don't hear it the same way you hear music. I hear it in my own particular way. See, I loved Encoda, the family, watching her performance. 
and watching that show and just seeing the camera focusing on you, watching it and enjoying it in your way and being so proud. I love that scene. It is a great scene. Being a mom of four in real life, I, uh, I, and again, none of my family members are deaf, so my kids, I would often go to their performances at school, uh, whether they were singing or acting or whatever it is or skit they were involved in, and I would sit there patiently just like Jackie, but I was very proud to be standing there just as Jackie was, to be courageous enough to perform in front of everybody. I mean, I know the feeling of what it's like as a mom to be proud of your kids. You know, there <laughs> they are up on stage. But I, at the same time, I don't get the same uh, I, I don't get the same thing from the performance as the parents who can hear or the grandparents who can hear. And in CODA, I thought it was a perfect opportunity to highlight. And, you know, Sean really understood how we are able to feel. I mean, we're left out, not intentionally left out, but you can understand how we feel when we show up. We're there to, to lend our support, but at the same time, we don't hear the music the same way you do. So she took off the sound for two minutes to show the audience watching the film, how we feel in a performance. This isn't obviously our world. And the character's world is what I mean. I'm not saying that all deaf people don't like music. There are lots of us who love music and appreciate music. There are deaf rappers, a guy named Sean Forbes, and there's another uh, performer named Wawa. Um, they're all, at the same time though, uh, having done what Marley and I and other deaf people have done during a performance, We'll sort of talk about other things. It's the way that Jackie and Frank did. You know, what are we having for dinner? What are you going to make? Spaghetti? Okay, fine. We have to stop at the store. I mean, that's typical. Uh, Sean, during shooting, said, well, what, what are Marley and... It wasn't in the script. We improvised that scene. <laughs> and it was totally improvised. I started it, and I knew what I was doing, so we went along with it, and then and they ended up loving it. It was great. It was perfect, because that's what happens. It was authentic. I loved it. I acted all through high school, and my parents talked through my performance, too, but, you know, it was for a different reason. <laughs> you must have been really bad. That's why, that's why I didn't become an actor, I'm sad to say. But <laughs> I wouldn't know, so again, I don't know what you like. You're so much fun. Thank you, Marley, for joining us on the act. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Always a pleasure.